So moving into my 50s, I'd like to focus on looking ahead versus the rubber band snap back to the past. However, a milestone paired with a glance back can help inform the future. I'd also like to move forward by remembering to layer in love when I can, like spreading buttercream frosting on a red velvet cake. I want to do a better job of approaching situations with love. And what is love but a whole lot of gravity and grace? Back in the day, I was a Sue. But the name never fit right, so I stretched it back to Susan. Being called Sue doesn't bother me, it just reminds me of someone I used to know. But Sue also allows me to laugh at myself, which is one of my favorite survival skills. With the name Sue, I get my own little nickname, which explains one of my weird quirks. One. I am Tsunami. I get what I call tsunamis, as in tsunami, when an earthquake creates a massive tidal wave. For me, it's a sudden emotion crashing down, unpredictably, surprising me with its force, and I'll unexpected, unexpectedly either laugh or cry or both. It's a little hard to witness, I suppose, and maybe you get these too, but now when it happens, now that I've learned to breathe, it makes me feel alive. They don't scare me anymore. The name Susan actually means graceful lily or full of grace, which makes me laugh. I learned that back as a teenager and felt quite the opposite. I felt large and klutzy. And while I couldn't articulate this back then, I see now there was a mind-body disconnect, something I couldn't necessarily name or understand, especially not at the time. I also see now that this disconnect began to heal in my 20s when I found ceramics and started creating with clay. This was the same time frame I was meeting my future husband, finishing a master's degree, teaching and traveling, getting a golden tree or puppy that we jokingly called our commitment test, marrying and becoming Peace Corps volunteers in Kenya, the two of us stepping out into our lives together. Admittedly, we shirked our dog duties by leaving Gracie Girl with my parents during Peace Corps, but they did as so many parents do, with love, and looked after our dog while we were away. So my little Peace Corps trilogy ends tonight, part one, of Blotter Their Mom some time ago, I outlined a Peace Corps success, my impromptu demand for gender equity in the form of claps. Four claps for the girls, just like the boys. Part two was trauma, and I told the story of my narrow escape from physical attack, physical attack by an angry mob of men. Three 20-somethings en route to a safety and security meeting for Peace Corps women. This experience left me with acute post-traumatic stress symptoms, anxiety, panic attacks, troubled sleep, flashbacks, waking myself screaming in the night, PTSD is a mind-body meltdown. And for me, the connection was already tenuous at best. So after a week of intensive therapy, when this happened in counseling in Nairobi, I was ultimately sent back to Washington, D.C. for a month to finish treatment with the intended goal of returning to our site. I left my new husband alone in Kenya to wait and worry while I attempted to heal in D.C. That was 20 years ago this month. The year was 1999. Later I would learn that back at our site, a flea-ridden, skeletal little puppy wandered into Scott's life and he poured his love and fear and worry about me and what had happened into feeding and caring for the poor little pup. Both a little lost in a land that could be harsh on humans and animals alike. Fast forward with me now to the present day to close it all out, part three. Present day is in last June, Scott's birthday. Our boys are teens and they are bad shoppers. And since they don't really know what to get a dad for his birthday, the kids and I joked we would give him a puppy because they wanted a puppy. Ha, huh, that's funny, let's get dad a dog. The birthday passed with no pup, except for when the kids shared the inside joke, Scott shocked us all by saying, yes, he actually did want to get a dog. Naturally, they were thrilled Naturally, I was shocked. What? You see, we already have a dog, and I've always been her primary caretaker. She's a beautiful black lab named Macy, a rescue with a mysterious and unknown background, a damaged dog that came our way back in 2011 when she was one or two years old, the vet's best guess at the time, and no, not spayed, but showing evidence of a recent litter. So skittish and shy, so scared and fearful of my gentle and mild-mannered husband that for months after we took her in, he would walk into the front door backwards so not to scare her. She was deathly afraid and clung to me. Macy's nine or ten years old and still with us, a perfect and loyal creature. She has gravity and depth and soulful eyes that draw you in and speak to you. Well-behaved and responsive to humans, she's practically the adult in the room. 
<laughs> the polar opposite of a puppy. So we hold a family meeting to discuss. Raise your hand if you want a puppy. So three hands go up and none of them are mine. <laughs> I think of the approaching school year and how both, both, both boys will be in high school. I have a new or perceived new freedom on the horizon and I'm ready to embrace it. I know exactly what it means to get a damn puppy. Mom becomes the bitch's bitch and there goes my freedom. <laughs> And then there's puppy training, and don't even get me started on that. I know exactly who's getting trained, and it is not the dog. And because I'm a puppy school dropout, I am not into it. I'm also quite confused that my practical, efficient, and busy husband, who travels extensively for work, wants a puppy. So soon I start to get angry and resentful about things, all inside my head, that hadn't actually happened yet and all churned around in there until I finally stepped back to apply a little gravity and grace. Past puppy stories came up and soon we were discussing a dog that I have never seen and only heard about. That sad, skinny, flea-ridden puppy from Kenya that Scott had poured his time and attention and broken worried heart onto while I was in DC long ago. And suddenly I feel that somehow, perhaps he needs the dog. I did inquire whether he wanted to get like a car, a second car, a convertible, uh, something fun, something I could drive to, and I asked and joked and hoped, but no. He wanted a puppy. We get the dog. It was a semi-planned pupperhood. And while the arrival of Rosie, our golden retriever puppy, Princess Pupper, was planned, my physical reaction to her presence was not. I'm suddenly just getting hot. That's all. <laughs> Rubber band snap back to infancy and childhood. A snap back to the anxiety and exhaustion of child rearing. I'd forgotten the psychosis of early motherhood. Heart throbbing, chill inducing moments of sheer panic. Where's my child? At the park or in a crowd or in a store when you've looked away for one second. Like one second. <laughs> Where's the pupper? This all arrived PTSD style in flashback form. We had Rosie in our possession for less than 15 minutes when I got in the back seat of the car decided our five pound tiny little baby cotton ball of a puppy who you could hold in one hand needed some air and rolled down the window on I-57 and all I could see was her squirmy, puffy, puffer body getting sucked out the window. Puffer goes poof! <laughs> Breathe. And I began to realize how much of early parenting, for me anyway, was full of anxiety. Because now, in the hot flash of a second, I have a canine, infant, and a toddler all rolled up into one. I'm back on death watch, where you have to save them from themselves, where everything on the floor is a death trap or a surgery, where everyday items are dangerous or toxic. The little green bread bag could be swallowed, a grape, an almond. Everything's now poison. What's in the puppy's mouth? Every five seconds, gates and crates and errant toys littering my house. Panic. Where's the pupper? She is tiny and slippery and precious and fast. And I'm so turn, tuned into the pupper in her needs and feel it on such a physical level that I begin to wonder if I'm going to start lactating. She's a cyclone of energy, gives me whiplash, thinking a few steps ahead and keeping track of what I'm thinking and doing. A much tougher task now that I'm almost two decades older, trying to remember all the while that I am not crazy <laughs> yet. But I feel crazy, like the day I take Pupper and Macy to Little Street for a visit, and somewhere in between negotiating the twisting leashes and abundant energy, not to mention not breaching, breaking fragile pots all over the studio, I lose track of my phone, and it takes seven hours to retrace my steps to find it. I narrow it down to not in the main floor classrooms, and there are five, not in my studio, not in my purse, but somewhere in the car, according to the GPS Life 60, Life 360, and my ever-reliable husband, who I call at work on someone else's call at work on someone else's phone. Okay, check Life 360. Where am I now? You're at Little Street. So I drive home. Call from an, the house phone. Where am I now? You're at home, but you stopped at CVS. <laughs> Next call. You're back at Little Street. No longer frantic or perplexed, I'm now furious. Mother Popper, she's got a swear that is associated with her now. It has to be in this car, it has to be in the car. I rip the car to shreds, look under the seats, in the glove box, under the floor mats, can't find the phone. 
Ben comes home from school. He's also misplaced his phone that morning, somewhere in his room, and I am so over looking for my own phone that we trade search missions. I have pupper brain, like mom brain. I feel crazy and stupid, irresponsible, old, and if I can't find the phone, I know the pupper is winning. I easily find Ben's phone under his pillow. He's a boy, many of them can't find things. Yet my 6'1 child amazingly comes through for me and finds my phone, not in the car, but where? Any guesses? Her, 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 her. Jane, help me. <laughs> on top of the car, with me driving around all day looking for it. <laughs> Rosie Popper is adorable and mind-bendingly so. She's the color of a roasted, toasted marshmallow with champagne ears, and now the cotton ballishness has given way to a silky, wavy, sexy pupper coat, and she's a fluffer nutter pupper. Silky, smooth, like the velveteen rabbit of all puppers. 100% innocent, except for those beady, serial killer eyes. Not soulful and deep like Macy's, but simple little rivets of certainty. Because pupper don't give a fuck. <laughs> but I do. Because she's just that adorable and hypnotic. And even though she has chewed the legs of the table my brother made for me, as well as much of the molding in the kitchen, many of the teenagers' to-do lists, her dog training notes on a yellow legal pad, my visa bill, and a host of other items. Oh, wow. I have her in the first place because she is my attempt at buttercream frosting love layering. She, like all of our dear doggy dogs, is love. All love. In our human lives, dogs play supporting yet starring roles. Gracie and Macy and Rosie the pupper, and the flea-ridden skinny little puppy I never met back in Kenya 20 years ago. They layer our lives with love. They're an opportunity to ease the gravity of life with laughter and connection. They are the buttercream frosting on the red velvet cake. So I'm gonna keep layering it on. Just as long as someone can tell me, where's the pupper? Who let the dogs out? Yeah.